All right, so um, I'm going to talk about um, debugging and uh, my uh, own uh, experiences with it. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about debugging in general, the trace, Erlang trace diff, and its role in debugging, and some uh, indubitably boring uh, war stories uh, related to that. Uh, if I can get this into. This is me, I work at Klarna, I used to work at Ericsson. So I spent 10 years at Ericsson uh, trying to find bugs in other people's code. It was a very interesting experience. Now I work at Klarna, and here's the, um, the story of Klarna in one graph. So the, this is the number of purchases per month since uh, well, the company was founded. I started working at Klarna here when uh, <laughs> it was like five pixels off the x-axis there. We thought that was pretty impressive. <coughs> Anyways, so uh, we've had some, uh, some uh, interesting scalability problems over the years. I was, I was inspired to give this talk uh, uh, by looking at this uh, parody account on Twitter. That's a pretty small font here, but uh, it says here that Go programmers doesn't like syntax highlighting. That's, it's childish and uh, uh, many stupid things like that. But uh, this thing in the middle here says, I'm a firm believer in printing stuff to the screen. It's the programmer's best debugging tool. That's actually true, I think, um, which is kind of sad that uh, this was equally true. 60 years ago. So if you want to debug stuff, in, in general speaking, then uh, you have some options, right? You can uh, just look at the code, which is uh, difficult because you have no context. You don't know what the, uh, the values of variables and stuff like that. You can do look at the postmortems, and uh, that's probably not going to help you either because you always dump the wrong thing. You can look at the logs. Uh, same thing there, you're always logging the wrong thing, and uh, you can run the debugger, but that doesn't work in production, of course. So, um, writing stuff to the screen with printf is the, the way to go, obviously. So you, you uh, get the right uh, context, and you're uh, printing from the right place in the code, obviously, you're not, uh, you don't have to print uninteresting stuff. It doesn't impact timing bugs much. <coughs> Probably, uh, the, the problem, of course, is that it's it's pretty long cycle. You have to uh, edit the code, uh, think about it for a while, uh, compile, load, blah, 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 especially if you're working on an embedded system with load modules or something like that. It takes hours. So uh, the, the feedback loop is too, too long. So course, if you're working in Erlang, you don't have to uh, suffer all those indignities. You just do the right thing right away. Um, and the right thing is, of course, tracing. It's a feature in the, in the emulator. Uh, it's always there. So you get all these, uh, <laughs> uh, all the good, uh, good bits here and none of the bad bits. It's uh, uh, pretty amazing. So how does it work? So essentially, the, the emulator is instrumented with a, a system that uh, emits messages to some, some process when uh, it's triggered, and you can tell it when, when to trigger by calling some built-in functions. The, there's two, two BIFs, the first one is the trace BIF. And um, it turns on the, tra the tracing per process. You tell uh, the emulator which process you're interested in, and there's a bunch of different types of traces. Uh, for example, the garbage collector or the scheduler. So you can trace, on, if you trace on the scheduler, you will get an um, event to your Erlang program every time the emulator does a scheduling event. So you can build a, a profiler on this, for example. Um, today, I'm just gonna talk about call tracing, which is trigger points that uh, uh, trigger when you call certain functions with, with certain arguments, actually. 
Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. This is, I'm not sure about the value of this slide, uh, especially for you people in the back there, but uh, here I'm trying to illustrate how the, tr the trace bit works by just by writing some stuff in this shell. Uh, and here the interesting bit is here, of course, where I call trace. So I, I say I tell it to send the uh, trace on the shell process, which, which is, the, yeah, well, the shell process. <laughs> True, I turn it on. Uh, I want running flag, which is the scheduler. Uh, so I spawn this, and uh, so now I'm going to get uh, messages to the to the shell itself, and these are the trace messages. So, ev oops. so every time the scheduler does something, uh, the in and out there is when you schedule in and out. Uh, you get an event. Well, that's pretty, uh, pretty awesome. But uh, not real convenient to write this stuff in the, in the shell. But anyway, so we're going to talk about printf today. Uh, and then you uh, want to instrument uh, Your, your code, right? So you want to say uh, if I uh, this function triggers, um, send me an event, and that should uh, be a very hard, of course, if you're running an uh, awesome emulator. So that's the second BIF that does this trace pattern, and uh, that uh, you call that with an MFA, and the, the emulator when you call this. With an MFA, the emulator will instrument that beam code, the beam code that belongs to that MFA. Um, and this is what's called a match specification. Uh, uh, match specifications is uh, like a little emulator inside the real emulator that runs a special uh, language, not, not a real language, but some kind of pattern matching languages, uh, language. Uh, and the match specific that's <laughs> yeah, I'll just try to show an example. Uh, <laughs> this is the documentation for the match spec match specs. But this is what it looks like. So imagine you're trying to uh, set up a trigger point on a function. So you, you decided a process you want to trace on, uh, an MFA that you want to trace on, and you also want a match specification um, which tells you more a more fine grained uh, about what, uh, when this thing should trigger. So this is going to trigger when the two, you call a function with two arguments that are equal. That's what this bit means. So the first list there is the argument list to your function. So they have to be equal and you bind it to $1 here inside the match specification engine. Then you have a, a guard here, which and that tells you that something should be less than le it's the head of the argument, dollar one. So the head of the argument should be less than three. And then the the last bit here is the the action you should take when this happens. So three things has to happen here for for us to get an, a trace ev event, and that is uh, we're in the right process. We're calling this function that we set up the trace pattern on, and this pattern is uh, matched. So here again, I, I'm doing this in the, in the shell just for illustration of how you can use this. So here's my, um, my MFA, lists append. The match specification is the one I just talked about. And then uh, I need uh, some. Uh, I need um, a process to, to that actually runs the trace. So I, I make a fun here and set up the my tracing. And this is the result. I spawn that tracer fun there. I just defined. I call list append twice. And uh, I should get one hit here, right? Because. The argument should be identical, and they, the head of the argument should be less than three, right? So the first call shouldn't trigger, and the second one should. And that worked. We got one message, the second one. All of this is a bit 
Yeah, okay. So, so how does this actually work then? So um, yeah, this is all text. Here's my uh, <laughs> yeah my uh, attempt at the illustration here. I'm not uh, really very good at uh, using kittens and and uh, unicorns and stuff like that. Uh, I spent like three days on this. <laughs> Anyway, so this is trying to illustrate a, a piece of beam code here, right? So this is a, a memory uh, area, this gray box, and uh, the orange things here is beam instructions, and the, the red arrow here is the program counter. So we move down like this uh, in, in the beam, as we actually, <laughs> when the interpreter run, uh, runs the program, it goes through the beam instructions here, right? So here's the entry point of the function, the uh, first instruction, the second instruction, etc. So when we've instrumented this, it looks like this instead. So we have an entry point, and then the first instruction is switched out. So we jump down to the trace pattern engine thing. Uh, does its tracing magic there, and then we go back, and on the way we run the first instruction, then we get back here to where we're supposed to be. So this is very quick when we don't, we don't hit anything. If, if the function is not called, there's no overhead at all, right? So if we're tracing this function and we, it's never called, there's zero overhead. If it is called, it's very little overhead because uh, running these trace patterns is very quick. So that's why the language is so cryptic. It, 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 you can turn it into something really fast, something that executes really fast. All right, hello. Ah. Uh, this is always uh, fun with war stories. This is my first uh, um, first time I ran into tracing. Uh, this is back in OTP R5. It was still called R5 then, not not like this fancy new five. Um, and tr tracing was really new. So in in those days, uh, um, Erlang was only used inside Ericsson, and um, it was. Uh, a lot of people, uh, old telecoms people, were had input in it, and they they wanted tracing because in the old Ericsson switches you could do this kind of tracing. At this time, uh, there was no other system really that could do this magic. Anyway, so I was working on this uh, this system, an embedded system uh, that didn't have any real debugging facilities. And the problem was that uh, after 90 days of uh, continuous traffic, it suddenly started going <laughs> much faster, slower. So we're talking about like a factor of 10 slower. And uh, we had not noticed this in our testing because uh, we never ran the test for 90 days. So the, in true telecom fashion, the Danish telecom people just sent a guy out there every 89 days and rebooted it, so they never experienced this. <laughs> uh, but they were unhappy with this because uh, that guy, uh, I don't know, that probably doubled his workload to have to go out there every 89 days. <laughs> so uh, I was tasked with uh, debugging this so I've just read about the tracing stuff in OTP then. So um, I figured out that uh, if I could uh, run uh, a trace on the whole system, uh, yeah. Back in those days, uh, you could only run tracing on BIFs. No, there was two different kinds of tracing. There was a BIF trace and a normal trace. So they didn't work very well. But uh, anyways, I wrote a piece of code. I couldn't log on to this system, of course. But I could uh, mail this guy, so he had pasted this. Uh, so they waited until the 90 days, so the, the um, assistant was misbehaving. Then he ran the trace, rebooted, ran the trace again. And then he got two files, and he emailed them to me. So pretty fancy back in the day, email. Mostly we used pigeons. <laughs> so I took, the, took those two files and wrote um, uh, a profiler. <laughs> very small. It only had to um, compare these two files, right? And it turns out that X, it's look up. That suddenly become 100 times slower. And um, 
it turned out that the hash function, a function was broken. So when the, there was a table and the table was keyed on an integer and when the integer became a big num, the hash function would always hash it to the same value. So er, all the data wound up in the same bucket in the table. So they linear searched millions of uh, objects there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I am sure that we would have never found that bug if, if it hadn't been for the Erlang tracing. So I was pretty impressed. Then I, uh, I'd, I'd worked on this for years, doing different kinds of tracing, and here's another war story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill out the time here. I'm not gonna let you go before my time is up. So here we have a live network in Germany this is a pretty big one. The Danish one was pretty small switch, but uh, this one had millions of people connected to it and uh, 10,000 ongoing calls at all times, pretty much. Um, this time I had, shell, I, I had a shell, uh, an Erlang shell, so I wrote this. <laughs> I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't upload code on it, I could only run stuff in the shell. So this is one line of code. Uh, but uh, the red bits here are called the, the trace bits. So <laughs> it's a little program that uh, basically uh, uh, profiles. Uh, so I ran that for a while and I killed the switch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was annoying. And especially since it turned out that the original problem was a hardware error, so I would have never found it anyways. So what do we learn from this? Uh, the, the tracing is super powerful. And you can do uh, really amazing stuff with it. But it's difficult to use, right? Um, so obviously I wrote my own. Well, I, there is of course something called DBG, I should say. It's part of OTP. This is a, uh, like a user-friendly layer on top of the trace bits. Unfortunately, I've, I've crashed many, uh, <laughs> many machines using that too, so it's, it's pretty complicated. You still have to use those match specifications, which are uh, difficult to wrap your brain around, or at least mine. And uh, it's, it's dangerous because it's easy to, to write a trace that will kill your, your Erlang machine. So I figured I'd write something that was more user-friendly and was pretty much guaranteed not to take down the system by being defensive about uh, how, it, how it worked. So uh, there's a program called Redbug and uh, it basically has one function. Uh, it takes two arguments. The first one is a trace and the trace specification. The second one is some options there. So the idea is that instead of writing the, this match specification, uh, this is uh, pretty uh, the, the one I showed earlier, I'd write something like this. So it looks like Erlang. It's not actually Erlang, but uh, so it's something that looks like Erlang, but it compiles to a match specification. So this bit compiles to this uh, exact same match spec. It's a lot easier to, to see what's going on, though, at least I think so. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and everything I, I talk about here is stuff that you can do in, in uh, with the trace bits, and probably with D DBG as well. I'm just going to use a red bug here as, uh, to illustrate this how it how it works. So you can sp uh, you can match in the in the function head and bind the variables so like we bind the x here, and you can uh, use guards. Uh, it's a subset of Erlang guards. But not everything can be run in a match spec, only some uh, subset of functions. So here's the same example again. And uh, uh, so I, I run uh, a trace on lists of pen with some uh, conditions there, and only the uh, one of them triggers, like you'd expect. It's another problem that uh, you sometimes uh, encounter is that you, you have a, a function that takes up all your CPU time. 
it maybe there's a function it get called with stupid argument and when you get called with a stupid argument it'll uh, do all kinds of work and lock up your whole system but this function gets called from a thousand different places so who called the function in, in this particular instance, so say somebody calls our lists append function here with these particular arguments and w something bad happens when we, we use these exact arguments. So then we'd like to know where did that call come from? So here we can use a, a stack um, action here. So when this triggers, we'll get the, the normal message here. So we call this to pen two two, but we'll also see here uh, a call stack. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> I give up. So in in this case, it was uh, kind of boring because we called it from the shell, right? So we already knew that. But uh, uh, if you run it on a real system, this could be super useful. Uh, you can also specify that you want to see the return value. So here, that's pretty, pretty dull, of course. So we call this to pen. We, now we, so we use this return action here. It tells uh, the emulator we want to see the return value. So here we get the normal one. We call this function. And here we get a second trace message where we can see what the uh, return value is. Um, that's in the Another one, this is a pretty new feature in, uh, in OTP. I think it came in in R15. You can do a very fast uh, call counting. If the only thing you want to know is how often is this uh, function called. So uh, it has a, uh, the emulator has support to keeping track of how often or how many times you call a certain function. So. Uh, so here we run a trace for, for three seconds and we just want to count. Um, so we get that here. So this thing was called twice, which is interesting <laughs> because I only called it once. But uh, it's, it's a bit uh, tricky to run this uh, particular, um, the call count trace as it's called in, in the shell because the shell does all kinds of stuff, right? And that also gets included in, in this tracing. If, if you do this call count tracing, it's very lightweight, but you can't specify which uh, process you want to call. Uh, you want to, um, you can't restrict this to a certain process. It just instruments the call. This is uh, also new, call the call time tracing, which is, uh, um, I haven't used this much, but uh, it's pretty, uh, it looks very fancy. So what do we do here? Uh, we we um, here we're tracing on lists, so everything in the lists module, and I tell it that I want to uh, see uh, uh, the times, which which is how much time it spends in each individual function in in lists in this case. Uh, and since uh, I don't have to uh, actually call anything in lists because the shell will uh, call lists all the time, so I get uh, tons of hits here, and at the end I get this. Uh, little summary here. So it, it called four different functions in lists. And uh, the first, or, uh, first number here, the first column is how many times. So flat length got called seven times. It's probably recursing. Uh, it only took seven milliseconds. It's pretty fast. Yeah, so flat length one probably calls flat length two here. Uh, this is a, this is a, a pretty uh, pretty fancy stuff. Um, you could uh, presumably build a profiler on this if it wasn't for this fact. So here's uh, some knowledge that uh, you might be interested in having if you are going to try to to run this. Um, I run the this trace twice. So I'm just tracing on lists for three seconds and and if you compare the numbers here so it's the same functions and they get same called the same number of times but the execution times are, are different and you of course you'd expect them to vary a, a bit 
but uh, lists fold there. So in one run, it took uh, 12 milliseconds and in uh, microseconds, and in one run, it took 1.7 thousand milliseconds. So it looks a bit strange that it suddenly got, uh, uh, what is it, 150 times slower. So what's happened here is that uh, the entire emulator has been scheduled out by the Unix scheduler, right? So um, it, the way this instrumentation works, it takes a timestamp when it enters the function and then uh, another one when it exits the function. It takes a difference there, updates the register, but if the whole emulator gets scheduled out, um, it's not gonna notice that. So it takes a second timestamp, a long time has, has passed. Um, and there are in modern hardware, you can uh, you have support in the hardware for for only ticking uh, timers when a process is scheduled in. But for my particular system, that wasn't supported. So that's uh, a pitfall. And uh, I think um, on Linux, it's uh, a problem you can't really work around. So you should be aware of this if you try to uh, check out this, uh, this functionality and, and run it in your own code. That sometimes it, you can't just trust this. You have to run this many times and see if uh, your numbers change. Yeah, uh, so some documentation here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the options here to uh, my program. This is... Um, just to, to give uh, some sort of idea of what you can do with the tracing here. Um, the red bug is, uh, has some, some safety features that uh, the normal uh, tracer doesn't have. So it'll quit. By default, it will quit after a while. It'll quit after a certain time or if it gets, gets enough messages. So by default, it quits after 15 seconds or 10 messages, whichever comes first. But it will also quit if the message queue gets long or it gets a message that's too big. So the idea here is that it shouldn't take down your node no matter what. So it'll prefer not to give you a trace than to uh, block you for too long. Um, so you can do a remote tracing so you don't have to run your, your the local node, you can specify a remote node. You can um, tell it to cache the, the trace messages sometimes. Uh, so the, the tracing will impact the, the, the way the system works, right? So if you run a trace, you're, not, you're, you're disturbing the system. And uh, depending on what you're tracing and on what kind of bug you're looking for, you want to, you can, you want to be able to trade off uh, how uh, how the tracer works. So sometimes it's convenient to uh, to block, for example. So if you do a red bug red bug start, normally it just exits directly, and it prints to the terminal when it's done. Uh, but sometimes you want to block instead and and get a list of trace messages as a return. Sometimes you want to uh, uh, buffer the trace messages on the remote node. You might want to uh, not see the arguments. By default, it'll, uh, it'll, uh, it'll get the arguments of the function is called with in, in the trace messages, but you can turn it off. Uh, that's convenient if you get very big messages where you're gonna, just gonna fill up your screen. Um, you can block. Yeah, you can also discard all the messages. If, if all you want is the, to count how many, how many times a function get called, for example, you don't want to see any of the messages and you can just discard them. And you can specify which processes you want to, uh, to uh, trace on. Uh, there's a, bu of a bunch of stuff. So you can also specify how this is printed, right? So uh, once you've collected all these trace messages, it will print them out by default to a screen or a file. You can uh, affect how the printing is done here. It's not very interesting. Um, 
Um, this is another, this is two ways that it can um, print to file. Normally, uh, or the normal case is that you just print to the text to a text file on, on the, uh, your local node. But you can, uh, th and that has certain impacts and you have to use the file system and blah, blah, blah. And you have to uh, do some work in Erlang and you might not want to disturb the system like that. So there, there is another way to, to get the emulator to write the trace messages straight to a file. So you don't have to go through, turn them into Erlang messages and handle them in, in your own code. <coughs> you can just tell the emulator, write these straight to disk. Um, so that's built into the emulator and then you can specify this using these options. And uh, that's what I was referring to here, the locality. So let's see if we can, yeah. So <laughs> that's another uh, masterpiece. So if this is the, the tracing here, the, the red thing here is when uh, uh, you trigger the tracing system and okay, so trace message is generated. There's three different ways you can, you can deal with this. You can either, you can write it straight to the, lo uh, the file system here. That is often the, f the, the thing that has the least impact on the way the system works. Pretty quick, it just flushes it out to a file cache somewhere. Uh, you can send it to an Erlang process that, uh, so this is little egg here is an Erlang process. So your trace message gets sent to a, a local Erlang process. Or you can send it to a remote process. You can of course also have it go like this. So it goes to the local process and then gets transferred to the remote process. But the, the tracing framework itself can, can do three different things here. And the, which one is the best depends on what you're doing. So the purple thing here will stress the network. The blue thing will stress the, the, the file driver. And uh, the green thing will, uh, ha has more CPU overhead because there you have to turn the trace message into an Erlang turn, send it up to Erlang world and have the Erlang code do something with it. So that's, uh, something you need to um, decide on. Yeah, I guess that was it, oops. Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> I thought there was something uh, missing here, my conclusion. So, um, <laughs> first one is not a, just an opinion. <laughs> uh, you can, uh, I don't know why I said C++ here. It's, it's easy, it's, this, this support, this tracing, uh, tracing stuff, it really enables you to, to uh, create reliable code. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome stuff. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, I'm not sure that debuggability is a real word, but, uh, if it isn't, uh, I think it should be because uh, the, the debuggability of Erlang is, is very, very high, it, especially and if you use this tracing stuff. You can really very quickly find uh, even very complicated problems. And I think it's a, it's a shame that uh, it's not so well known, I think, this feature. It's hidden somewhere in page 257 of the Erlang manual. That's really why I'm giving this talk. So you all can go out and spread the word to your Erlang friends. Use tracing. That's it. Well, well, the code is available here, of course. It's been open source since the 90s. <laughs> yes, we are waiting for the questions. Yeah, if no questions, then thank you for the presentation. <coughs>